Recently, I played through Halo 3 ODST with Chris, and these are our real thoughts after finishing the game. So you're a bigger fan of this game than I am, because this was your introduction to the Halo series, so I think our opinions are going to be a little bit on the opposite end of the spectrum, which I think is good for, for discussion, because I don't like this game at all. <laughs> I think it's kind of boring and a bit of what I, I, I call it a nothing sandwich, because you play it and then I really didn't retain much of it. Like, I've played this several times and I couldn't tell you any of the, like, good set pieces or something like that, because I honestly don't think there really is many. And what's funny going through it again with you, like, we run through half the levels <laughs> with dealing with enemies in, like, five seconds. It feels a lot less engaging than some of the other Halos, because it's pretty easy, despite the changes they made to make you feel weaker. And maybe it's a little different playing single player. <laughs> I feel like this game should be played more in single player, and also it didn't help that we played on Heroic just to get through it. I don't think we had much time that day. I, I can understand and not liking it because while we were playing it you pointing out some of the details in it and just how easily everything was handled except for a couple parts where we soft locked the game yeah we did we soft locked a part of the game <laughs> i don't necessarily blame the game for that i think that's just happens to be like older game ai kind of stuff because i'm sure if we were running through other halo games we could have soft locked them i know me and sono did soft lock halo 2 once or twice so i don't i don't blame the game for that i thought that was really funny though and we had to restart the entire mission because it wouldn't let us go back what i found dumb is i remember that moment was during the level you brought the ghost in and you tried ramming the guy through the area and there's the invisible wall yeah, and that is a strange thing because part of what makes Halo so special is slamming vehicles into areas they're not supposed to be. And so to put an invisible wall in like a very clear location that I should be able to throw a vehicle in it seems kind of a slap in the face to the Halo. Or, and I don't know, that's not like part of the core Halo formula, but like, oh yeah, if I want to drive this tank into a fucking tunnel in Halo 2, I can do that even though I'm not supposed to, but I still can. What they could have done, which would have been a different design entirely, would which would be uh, the automatic poles that go up that, that we have. I, I don't think we have them in the United States everywhere, but I do know. Right. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I know what it should be in, like the bollards. Yeah. Having it that way instead of those cheap barriers that go up at a 45 degree angle, because those technically still would be able to ramp them. What you could have done is those. So then it would have made sense. Yeah. Some kind of visual cue to like indicate, hey, hey you know, this is in your way, you can't get this over. I, f I feel like that probably just has to stem from the fact that this game was made really quickly. I, t I talked to you about this right before we started recording, but uh, Halo 3 ODST was made by a small team, or, or not small, but smaller, while they were waiting for the pre-production of Halo Reach to be finished. So this game feels like they had a team left over, they had people waiting on stuff, they had an engine left over, they just wanted to make something for the team to, to have something to do while they waited. And I guess it kind of feels like like that to me like i don't i don't feel like this game is anything amazing or or super special it feels like hey we got we got to make something let's make something with what we got and especially because there's there's what two new weapons uh, i guess technically the the brute plasma rifle shows back up which wasn't in halo 3 originally i can't think of any other weapons that like there was the smg the silenced smg and the silenced pistol which weren't in three and i think those are the only new thing even when we did this campaign heroic and we were speeding through most of it we got it under three hours like that's yeah it's pretty short and we weren't trying we, we died a couple times but if you can finish in under three hours in one sitting i died a lot more than you yeah <laughs> some of that might have been my fault from bad grenade throws but still <laughs> this game also not counting the prologue and epilogue there's eight missions and then Mombasa streets yeah so it's it's very short and Mombasa streets just gets reused and Mombasa streets isn't really a level it's like an area that you walk through going going about it if this was more of the the melancholy feel what they were going with with Mombasa streets and you would have done everything in one go like we were talked during our playthrough i feel like it could have been a lot better if they would have went more of that like what you were saying but i do also like the feel of you're the detective you go through and then you relive those moments that led up to it personally i personally like that yeah it's a bit strange because i think going back to how it was like a team they had left over and stuff i I think this game was a neat idea that they didn't get to execute on quite well enough because it feels like you know it just kind of got the leftovers uh, of what they had ready where if they had made from scratch and had the budget for like a true spin-off 
starring in ODST, it probably would have been a lot better because they could have focused more on making the mechanics unique and things like that. Because I think I think the theme of having a detective style game would be cool, but I don't know about making it starring an ODST because the ODSTs are supposed to be like frontline soldiers that no, they're not. Are they not? I thought that was what they were. Oh, no, they're they're hot drop behind enemy lines. That, that is their main thing. Okay. Their missions are similar to Spartans, technically. While Spartans can be deployed on the front lines, they were mainly used to fight like incursions of insurrectionists, like single solo missions, while ODSTs are with their squad. They may be used as frontline soldiers because they're technically more trained. It's just, it's not practical. It is weird that they, they introduce the squad at the beginning of this game, but then you're never actually with the full squad until the last mission. And even then, actually, no, you're never with the full squad, are you? Because the squad the squad eventually gets back together, but then Buck splits off to go get Dare, and so it's just Buck, Dare, and Rookie on the end. So you're never with the full squad in this game. And the other, the other group one... Buck is with them. It's Buck, Romeo, Dutch, and Mickey. So you're either with a group of four or a group of three. I never really noticed that while we're playing through. Another idea I thought of, I I really think they should redo ODST, but I doubt they would because it probably didn't sell as well as other games, other Halo games, and they probably don't want to go back to this because I don't like this. But thinking of it as, instead of just one squad of ODSTs, having multiple and combining some of these missions, if you get what I mean. And then they would link up for a moment, but they have their own missions to do. Like Buck's mission, they have to go find Dare and the engineer while this other group they got shot off a completely missed and they're in the dark so they they might have to listen to what Buck says since he's the leader. Yeah and that's why I almost think if they were to make another ODST game as a spin-off, I think making it into an XCOM style game I think would work really well because that way you can have small squads of like four or or five or six and they go on these separate missions but then that way you're it's all mechanically the same but you still get different characters and stuff like that and and you have an excuse. It's like your character could be like the their commander or something. So you're controlling these different squads and you get little stories as they're going through their levels. Because I think we could have gotten something like, I, I don't know if you've played XCOM 2 Chimera Squad, but that's it's like a much smaller kind of story focused XCOM game. I, I've played Enemy Unknown, and I think I've played the multiplayer of two. That's it. Okay. Chimera Squad was interesting because they, they mix up the mechanics where instead of you taking a turn and then the enemies taking a turn, they have turn orders. And a lot of the mechanics are getting around like how to get your soldiers up on the turn order before the enemies do or or setting up tactics. So what that when the enemy has their turn, you can like take them out before they get a chance to do something. And I think that would have worked perfectly for a Halo game because that, that still gets the illusion of like urgent gameplay that a halo game has but also you're controlling multiple characters i could see that but i I think that's a good idea but i also personally i would have liked if they did do something like that mixing in first person aspects where part of the game is the XCOM, and then part of the game is the classic halo like you're first person fighting them and this is kind of ironic because the game i'm going to mention the guy was the director of halo 5 yeah star uh star wars commandos or something okay yeah commandos that guy did halo 5 <laughs> which i which i thought was funny i i think a squad based thing because you could also do if you want to stick with the first person stuff oh republic commando republic commando okay because if you wanted to do an odst game based around the squads because you know spartans are i guess spartans had squads but like you know spartans are all about that you know master chief has always been like the solo guy if you wanted to do odsts to differentiate that you could have had odsts in a squad and you could have still had the first person gameplay but with a bit of squad mechanics and like controlling AI players specifically instead of just having them hang around with you to like differentiate that from Chief. Oh, similar to what they did in the five campaign, like when you can tell the AI what to do, but more in depth. Right. And that's because Halo 5 was made by the Republic Commando guy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I never played Republic Commando, but I did play five. I did not like it, but I did. It's similar mechanically, I think, but it's it works better in Republic Commando because it's a simpler, older game. <laughs> in five, it just kind of feels out of place. <laughs> you can also break the AI doing that. There, that's a that's a story for another day. <laughs> Leading up to the story, though, I'm going to go through each mission, kind of my thoughts of it, like prepare to drop the, the prologue. It had a good set up like what you said probably could have given the rookie a voice and you know 
that would have made it so much better. And not having the fact that he was sleeping through the entire thing and somehow is magically knowing exactly what they said throughout every mission. <laughs> and you know what? I think if this game were more focused on Dare and even playing as Dare, it would make a lot more sense because you're, you're given a mission. You're told you're going to get on this Covenant supercarrier. So you you get to the drop and then Dare tells you, oh, we're going to we're going to drop somewhere else. And you're like, what? well, that's not that wasn't our mission. So like, what's our mission now? Well, OK, we're going to crash. We're going to we get separated from our squad. You don't know what your mission is for the entire game until you happen upon Dare as Rookie. And then it's revealed that was her plan all along of like getting to the engineer. So if you were playing as Dare, you would have more insight because obviously she knows what she's doing. So there would be the, there would be those things. I don't know or if the rookie was replaced by Dare. You could have Dare doing the detective stuff to try and get the squad back because she needs the squad for the mission. It would make a little more sense than having the rookie in that place. You could do that and then you could just wipe rookie out of the equation entirely. But I don't know. It, it's always kind of been a staple up until like in the later Halo games where it's like the main character doesn't talk or even if talks at all. Well, so Chief has always talked. Chief doesn't talk much, but he speaks in Halo 1, Halo 2, Halo 3. He speaks a lot in in Halo 4, but that's that's later. But uh, and even Noble Six in Reach, even Noble Six in Reach speaks, but Rookie never says a single word, which is out of place. I think, because Chief only ever spoke when he needed to, it was necessary for the scene. Rookie doesn't speak even when it would be necessary for the scene. I don't think he even needs to say much, because you don't have to have him say anything to contribute to the plot necessarily, because a lot of what Chief used to say was just basic one-liners or like a simple question that could have been answered regardless in you know, Halo 1, a lot in Halo 4, but <laughs> Rookie, they, they sort of skip over the fact that Rookie doesn't speak, especially when he gets back to Dare, she asks him a couple of questions and then just decides not to follow up on him. So Rookie does talk outside of the game. He talks in the books? Yes. Okay, there goes my theory of him being a, uh, a telepath. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I'm reading this from the Halopedia.org or Rookie page. At some point it was revealed that the Covenant Forces attacked some of the home colonies on Mars and Luna on their way to Earth, killing most if not all of the rookie's relatives back on Luna. He disliked talking about it, and when asked by Buck, he just gritted his teeth and stated that there's nothing left there for me now. Okay, so he does speak in the books, which also makes it weirder now, but <laughs> I don't know. It's strange. I mean, is there like a personality thing on here? I, I want to look into this, but it's just, I can understand that if he was a younger and like he see, he saw some horrible things in the war and he just doesn't like talking, but he, he doesn't talk at all during the game even to himself which would be understandable but talking to other people you know maybe he did that like it, it's not that uh, theory that rookie's actually in hell and what? each level is actually this one of the circles of hell like Mombasa streets is limbo do people really think that that is that is a theory what a fan theory that <laughs> that's ridiculous like, uh, the first level uh the plasma mission is the first level uplifters is the second level and the scary thing it actually lines up <laughs> with a lot of the bullshit that they throw in there. It lines up with the same way that conspiracy theories line up with reality is they've they've cherry picked things to like get it to work. That that sounds like complete nonsense. Yes, but it's still like to me, a, you know, it, I know it's not true, but like the the random conspiracies people have are really interesting to see. And the way they cherry pick it just is insane. Each one going through in coastal highway is him getting out of hell. <laughs> Which, which is also funny because we had the joke about Ricky never made it out of his drop pod and all of the events of the game were just him <laughs> bleeding to death. <laughs> and and you, you mentioned this already. Rookie, every time he comes across a piece of evidence, starts hallucinating conversations that he never heard. Even if we say, you know, he wasn't really asleep, because he was asleep the entire time. So even if we say he wasn't really asleep in his pod and he was overhearing those, he could have understood that for the very first one. The rest of them are complete. He never would have heard them. And there's no way. <laughs> and our our fix for that was if Rookie met Virgil, the, the engineer, first at the beginning of the game and Virgil, you had maybe collected evidence for Virgil through video footage or something. That way, each lead into a level would be Rookie watching over video footage trying to find his squad. And then you hop into the squad during those missions, which makes a lot more sense because it's recorded footage of them speaking and not Rookie just hallucinating things. Even if you 
did all of Mombasa streets first and you find a couple of the clues like you find the helmet and you see the pod then it cuts off like during a cutscene, and you see a cam like it goes from a camera's point of view like zoom zooms on the rookie like does that weird whatever they do whatever he does and then he's just like huh this is weird and continues on following some type of random hints of like there was a battle over here i'm gonna go check this out you know, sees the uh, Goss cannon from the one mission. Okay, maybe I'm getting closer. See some other stuff. Sees the exploded building. Like, and, you know, each time he finds those pieces of evidence, it, it'll show, like, the camera zooming in on him. And then he makes it down there. You know, like, the whole regular story, maybe a couple things change here or there. Finds Virgil, and Virgil does all of this, like, okay, here's the computer, you know, because he trusts you, and shows you everything. Then you go through the actual story. Like what you were saying, it would be pretty good. And then while you're going through one of them, Dare shows up and's like, "What are you doing? How are you already friends with him?" Uh, you had mentioned this when I had suggested that first. That would end up front loading the game with a whole lot of detective work. And if you're expecting it to be an action game, I think that would turn a lot of people off. Where where this one is more interspliced with walking around doing detective work and then action scenes and then more walking around, which I already don't like. But I to me, it's a good balance. But you could have done it better. If the game had a stronger focus on some other mechanics, honestly, if the game had just have a strong focus on something that makes this game different from Halo 3, is as it stands, it's pretty much just the same as Halo 3, even though they've changed a couple of things. And speaking of things they've changed, I mentioned this in my real thoughts for, for Halo 3. Stamina is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> the whole staple of the Halo series is your shields, and I understand ODSTs don't have shields, but when you take away that visual indicator that your health is getting low and replace it with a vignette, it is just worse. And then when you have health as a bar that when it gets low starts to beep at you, it's really fucking annoying. <laughs> they could have done something really funny with that. Do like a, a tutorial almost, like what they did with your health. Uh, but your health thing gets slow, like when you drop out of the pod, and Rookie says, "I don't know, like name a random AI that's talking to him." It says, "Oh, shut the hell up," and then you know turns that off. But your screen is you know slightly red. That could be funny. Yeah, like making fun of the mechanic. If they wanted to do, because stamina works the same as shields. I know that they talk about oh, ODSTs don't have shields. Stamina is shields, so they got rid of that visual indicator. So I I don't know. Maybe they could have like doubled the health, and that way when you get shot, your health always goes down, and you can go and get med kits or something that way you always have like a visual indicator i know the beeping I, that just needs to go but they, they would have always had like a visual indicator of how much health you have left because stamina is so arbitrary it's hard to tell when you run out of stamina and start taking regular health damage and i know there were several times i ended up getting killed because it was like oh i suddenly started to take damage when i thought i was okay because this vignette is hard to tell with the call of duty games or or whatever battlefield call of duty when that red vignette starts showing up that is your health and so when it gets to its arbitrary point where you die that is just where you die with odst it functions as shields i feel like they tried copying that from call of duty but they didn't want to just have only health there was an interesting thing i had read that i, I could have had armor like an armor damage bar so maybe instead of shields that go down they have a bar that goes up and then when it hits max then you start taking regular damage because the whole way odst armor works is like because they don't have shields they're designed to like disperse the plasma over the armor that will keep it from heating up as fast so maybe as you take damage the armor heats up and then when the armor heats up too much then you start taking damage that way you have a visual indicator of the heat level or some something you know some kind of visual indicator that is slightly different than shields going down but that would be also something on the HUD. That would be another like indicator on the HUD. Right, yeah. It would be it would be a visual visual indicator where instead of shields and health, it's a bar that goes up and then when that hits your health goes down. I, I do remember you talking about this during our playthrough as well. The I don't know if it was this game in particular, but saying like the HUD is too overflowed. Like that's too small. Like you can't really see as much with it. I don't remember if this was if it was ODST or if it was a different game talking about i was talking about the the hud lines basically the important information on the hud in this game is ammo health map so if you just had those that would have been fine but they also added yellow or brown lines to indicate that this is an odst helmet which they also had in halo 3 with blue lines to have chief's helmet and i think that is unnecessary because it's just extra visual clutter i think it was more visible in odst because it's super visible anytime you're in a dark area it just blocks the screen where it's not as much of an issue when it's bright outside because it's it's not fully opaque and then in halo 4 and 5 it is so much worse because they not only have lines 
scenes and stuff that are all extra. It's they've got blurry text that you can't even read. They've got literally opaque parts where you can see like parts of Chief's helmet. That's it just block part of the screen. And with Infinite, they're still doing the lines, but it's like a really, really, really minimalistic version where the lines are like only attached to the health bar at the very top of the screen, I think is the only place. So it's less intrusive and they still got their lines thing. But when you get to Halo Reach, they got rid of the HUD lines because they realized with Halo 3 and ODST, it's unnecessary. So it's just the the health bar um, and shields, your gun, your map, your equipment, your grenades, and then like a, a compass at the top versus what it is in Halo 4. And then Halo 3 has the same stuff, like the blue lines. You just don't really notice it most of the time because it's not as noticeable when it's bright, but it is more noticeable when it's dark and it's dark a lot in ODST, which is, I think, why it's it's more annoying in ODST because it's unnecessary. It's just fluff that takes up the screen that you don't need. And that's obviously that's a nitpick because like I've never liked that, but I think it doesn't bother most people because they either don't notice it or don't care. I notice it at times but it's not really noticeable as as an ODST fan. What's also funny is there's there's always people that say this game really makes you feel like an ODST because of the changes that they made, but I never got that feeling because I always felt like I was just playing Master Chief. Guns are a little weaker playing as an ODST. There's a little more kickback on a couple of weapons. You have a health instead of shields. You've got less jump height. You take more damage falling, whatever. But ultimately, you do all the same things that, it, that Chief does. And even funnier, because there's a scarab fight in this game, you do stuff Noble Six can't even do. Because <laughs> Noble Six doesn't never fight a scarab <laughs> the, in the pillar of autumn mission they drop down directly on you i always thought you were supposed to jump on them and take them out like you did in halo 3 but you can blow the cores open like you do in halo 3 they just don't explode so they're they're just weird set pieces that are meant to not be touched and then there's the cutscene where carter just slams into one instead of us trying to fight it which was weird because it's like obviously these things are not that hard to fight because you fight four of them in halo 3 and a rookie takes one out in odst that wasn't Rookie that took him out, but... um. Oh, no, that's right. That was Buck. That's going to be weird to me because I never had the instinct. It also might have been the fact that my first Halo game was ODST, then Reach. And I never really had the thought of, oh, I'm going to fight this thing. Because when I fought it before, I was in a Banshee. This time I have a Mongoose and my guns. I never thought of getting onto it and taking up the core. So my thought was just, I'm going to just drive on past it and see what happens. Yeah, I, I had eventually figured that out. But the first time I played, because I had gone, through, you know, Halo 2 where you fight and blow up Scarab. Halo 3 where you fight and blow up four Scarabs. Then Halo Reach is like, nope, you don't get to fight a Scarab. Yeah, even then, the Scarab fight in ODST to me was just it, like, it was a nice, very nice change of pace going from on the ground. I, I know in Uplift Reserve, you had to drive through everything. You had to drive to the end of the game. And I believe the mission afterward, the Boulevard mission, you were in a tank correct yes yeah even then it, it makes you experience everything in the game it makes you like go through on foot fighting through enemies go through or just speed past how most people do that the warthog and then you just blow everything up with the tank then you go back on foot and the whole experiencing everything thing is what again makes it feel like i'm not playing someone unique to chief and we go through the check mark of everything chief does in halo 3 we do in in odst we drive a bunch of vehicles we drive a tank we fly a banshee you fight but you fly a hornet in halo 3 but you fight a scarab all those kinds of things they don't differentiate it enough from the stuff that you do in halo 3 before you continue i'm going to say i do not think that this game makes you feel like an odst i feel not the entire game i feel like the stealth yes i feel like the mombasa streets mission is where you're being the investigator i should say like the you and you can play that stealth i think that is more of the the thought when i think of an odst not just the the run and gun you're going through like chief <laughs> Well, let's talk about the stealth real quick. Let's talk about the stealth. <laughs> When you, when you mention you can stealth through the Mombasa Streets levels, what you mean is you can sneak past the enemies without fighting them. Because as soon as you fire your weapon, even though it's a silenced SMG and a silenced pistol, they don't act any differently than just firing regular weapons. There is no stealth in this game that isn't the same with all the other Halos, where 
sometimes you can sneak past enemies when they don't notice you. There are no stealth mechanics, despite the fact that they present it as if there is, which seems like a missed opportunity. Even if there wasn't, it doesn't make sense in the fact that you hit a grunt, another grunt will turn around, and then you shoot him. The grunt doesn't make a sound at all. There's no way that he just alerted 30 squads in the area, making a gasp. Having this be an like optional stealth game would, would have been kind of fun, I think, and, and really make a difference on like how it can be played. I really want them to redo this game, even though I know that's not going to happen. They might make it with better graphics, if anything, but I doubt it got an enough love for that to happen. Yeah, if they were to remake this game, I would hope they would focus on fun gameplay mechanics, obviously, but that that are different from the other mainline Halos, so you get a unique experience and feel like you're not just doing the same stuff. Doing the same stuff is fun, I understand, because I really enjoyed Halo 3, and the same the, the action levels in this are still fun. It's just because it's not any different, it feels like I wouldn't be missing out if I didn't play this game. I can agree with that. You you really aren't missing out. This this is a side game. This is something that they just threw together and in a little little amount of time. I am also biased in the fact that I don't like Master Chief. I don't like the fact that the character is based off of luck. He is just the embodiment of a normal spark that just has a tremendous luck yes in the books he does have great leadership skills that's why you know he's the commander of his squad but you don't show that that off in the games you really don't halo 5 yes but that's five games too late i understand yeah because if we're talking purely the games master chief is not that interesting of a character like his whole his whole shtick in all the games is tall cool green man <laughs> and they tried to change that in halo 4 and it was super weird because he started out asking a bunch of questions and and being more like a dumbass instead of tall cool green man it's like let me ask all of these irrelevant questions that if it were written like the previous games cortana would just talk to me about cortana has always been the narrator for things like if you're on halo one chief never would have asked oh hey do you think it's snowing because the ring has inclement weather or if it's just natural no that's something cortana notices and cortana's the smart one who notices like oh halo 2 like this lake couldn't have been formed by volcanic activity right like chief never would have asked that cortana Cortana tells us that unprompted because it's something she finds interesting and we as the players will also get to find interesting because Chief doesn't care. Chief just wants to shoot stuff. And in Halo 4, it's like, who is he? Where is he going? Where are we? Like, Chief doesn't ask those questions. Chief asks, uh, what's next? Where do I find a gun? Cortana would just tell us, hey, this is the Didact. Here's what he's doing. Here's where he's going. Then we just go because she's expected to know those things and tell us what to do. A bunch of these Spartans are just so much more interesting. Yeah, and the books have always been a little more interesting about the lore. The books do give more character, more in-depth feel of the characters. But just thinking, James, he is one of the only Spartans that's officially MIA. Most of the Spartans knows when they're KIA, but they they always claim them as missing spartans never die that's their quote like james fought two hunter a hunter duo got his arm singed off from the elbow down and still beat them i I actually don't want to go into a tangent on that because there's just a whole bunch of characters then yeah sorry i I do get off topic talking about halo a lot no i get i get that like we can always talk about that some other time too as like a separate video if people are interested because i don't really know much about the books i I only read one but i do i do own a couple the idea that this singular engineer is our prime mission in the game is something that just kind of throws me off and i know it's like oh he has all the data on the covenant and he's mixed his data with the covenant with uh, our data and the ai but i, I just don't like the, the fact that we have to go rescue this one specific engineer i think it would have almost have been interesting if we knew you know we needed the data before we scuttled the city or something and it ends up that the engineer is there and now we have to protect the engineer like that would have been uh, maybe an interesting twist a cool little twist instead of like dare actually gives us the mission like oh hey let's okay i need you guys we're gonna gonna get down there to you know the center of the city if we knew what we were doing if everybody was briefed before the beginning of the game it would make sense to swap between all these different perspectives because then they know what they need to end up doing they need to end up going somewhere and so we'll all converge together we get to see their separate stories of like where they landed the little side mission they had to go on and then getting back together as it stands it's 
kind of luck that they they end up back together. Like the two dudes end up being told, hey, there's a Sergeant Buck on the radio looking for you guys. And so if everybody knew, hey, we need to go into these catacombs to get the city's data, and that was all they knew, we would have like a unifying goal with everybody. And the reason that they're going through these levels is because they want to help out because they're ODSTs and they're not just going to abandon people who need help, but also we know where we're going to end up going. Talking about the these ODST, the squad, personally, going back through this, I don't know why I like some of these characters. These guys are <laughs> very, very bland. <laughs> yeah, and their whole deal is it's the cast of Firefly, and that's that's was like the selling point. It's like, oh yeah, Buck is Nathan Fillion. I can't remember the other names of the characters are are Ellen Tudyk and Adam Baldwin, and the Dare is I guess she was a character on Firefly, but she's like Battlestar Galactica was her thing, and then I don't even remember the, the sniper. I don't even think he was a Firefly character. I I think he's just some dude <laughs> they all have like one personality trait and the sniper sucks <laughs> the the sniper he's he's the cocky asshole we have the strong silent silent lone wolf guy that we play as which is funny because if we're going through all of these things they have the same character archetypes in reach but they're done a little bit better cat is dare the sniper is june the demo guy is is george the other demo guy is a me i don't know there's like two demo guys in this game i don't know what the difference is between them adam baldwin and alan tudyk's characters are basically the same to me i guess one is supposed to be like the heavy weapons guy and the other's the demo expert which is usually the same archetype in movies and stuff which they made george into yeah it's usually the same mickey is the the explosive ordinance and an uh, unofficial pilot. I think he's the one that we play as when we drive the Warthog. In Uplift Reserve. Oh, no, wait. No, that's Dutch because Dutch has the Spartan laser. Right, Dutch. Okay. Yeah, see, this is this is another problem. I don't remember who anybody is. <laughs> I only recognize it because it says signature weapon is the Spartan laser for Dutch. And during that one mission, the primary character has the Spartan laser, which another thing that we talked about during our playthrough <laughs> You play a, the ODST, you're playing as Dutch, and then the other players are just random ODSTs. Yeah, players two through four are rookie. They look exactly like rookie. <laughs> <laughs> it's just... Like, who are these people? And that would have been solved if the game was focused around having a squad with you at all times, because then players two through four would assume the roles of the AI squad members when you play with other players. Or even other Marines. Like, you could have had other Marines with them. And, you know, just like, for Dutch anyway, it's like, hey, it's the, it's an ODST, let's let's go get them. Well, m maybe, because the whole point of choosing an ODST was because they are slightly more powerful than a Marine, so I think making players two through four a Marine wouldn't fit thematically. But there are very very easy ways they could have included three other ODSTs rather than let's just toss some characters in because who cares? <laughs> <laughs> More rookies in. So then that theory that he actually died in the pod makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And then it's like um it's it's like the joke I had made with Halo Reach. It's like Noble One, Noble Two, Noble Three, Noble Four, Noble Five, Noble Six, Noble Six, Noble Six, and Noble Six. <laughs> I also thought it was really funny. Um, they say he's got a punctured lung. Then they fill his lungs up with with a med canister. That's not how you fix a punctured lung. It's it's twenty five fifty two. Two, yeah. Don't worry. We know what we're doing. We're 500 years in the future. <laughs> we're 500 years in the future, but we're still using technology that we have around today. Just a little bit better. Like, a tiny bit better. Yeah, and that would get into, like, deep lore if we were to talk about that. So I don't think we'll go that far. I think Romeo should have died when the chieftain smacked him. The sniper rifle should have just been, like, completely cut in half. And because... Brutes are fucking strong. And this thing's like eight foot five. It might be a little bit taller just because of how small uh, Buck was when he jumped on it. Yeah. yeah. And Chieftains are some of the tougher ones because they're the like leaders of the pack. There's a lot of interesting decisions about this game. Because, yeah, we haven't really talked about specific levels. We've really just talked about generally. I think most of the levels are really forgettable because they're so short. It's like going from prepare to drop into the like first mission Mombasa Streets. I think that was a great start. Even even if it showed like changing it to prepare to drop, showing rookie land, and then you know show each of the other 
people like where they landed then go into one of the missions would have been good but Mombasa streets the feel of it just we already talked about stealth and everything if they would have done better stealth mechanics it could have been a lot better it's weird because prepare to drop the whole sequence of being in the drop pod in first person is super cool but then after all of this climax and hitting the ground six hours passes and so like all that climax is immediately deflated now we're just it's nighttime you know where the budget went i think they could have done something to ease us off or something like that you know with all the odsts dropping in if we had had a successful drop you know getting a bunch of odsts running through some enemies and then getting knocked out or something or separated from our squad something like that for a while i honestly think because i just replayed it titanfall 2 does the odst beginning better because you start in a drop pod in titanfall 2 as well and you start fighting through some enemies call of duty style and then you get knocked out by a titan that shows up and then another a friendly pilot comes down and you know knocks you out with some drugs so you'll be fine but you get to watch the friendly pilot fight toe to toe with this big fucking other titan and then he gets overwhelmed by another titan that shows up so maybe because at this point i guess at this point during halo 3 they didn't have any other surviving spartans but they could have had a spartan as part of the group leading the odsts and you could have dropped down fought alongside this spartan and then watch as the spartan gets killed by chieftains or a hunter or something you know he goes toe-to-toe with one but then gets overwhelmed and then you get knocked out or something like that i don't know well around this time okay this now that i think about it doesn't make sense overall but spartan threes were met this time technically they could have they could have just thrown an unnamed spartan three in there and been like hey commander wants us to drop down we're gonna be going down in five minutes get in your pod go there and then you know your whole sequence seeing seeing your spartan commander get just slapped by bruce and then your odsts run away while you're unconscious and like rubble that would have been a cool separation of this game from the mainline halos because master chief is so unstoppable in those but then we get to watch a spartan get slapped around by this stuff and realize like you know maybe chief is just more powerful than these things and this is the reality of the situation people don't always come out on top of these you watch the thing happen the nuke goes off well not nuke but you know what i mean like the the blast from slip space and then you wake up six hours later I feel like when, we, when we're talking about this, we're going so much more into like what could have made this better in our eyes. Right. Yeah. Rather rather than talking about what it is, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just feel like this game didn't get as much love as, as it deserved. Yeah, it definitely didn't because it was all just leftovers that they built in about a year because they had stuff that they could throw together. If they had put as much time and care into this as with Reach, because Reach was like a fully fledged developed game as a side game i think this would have been a lot better and a lot more unique tayari plaza i didn't really find much good out of that mission just because it kind of just felt it felt the same as mombasa streets but during the daytime this is the first mission where it feels like and obviously if you're playing through this the first time you may not notice but playing through it having the dead elites because there is no enemy ai for elites this is the point in the game where you're like oh okay this is just leftover shit because at this point in canon elites were still fighting alongside the brutes and the great skin where the brutes betray the elites on the orders of the prophets that hasn't happened yet so we should be fighting elites on tayari plaza but they're just already dead because they came up with some retcon that oh okay i guess the schism happened early on earth after they decided to leave because we don't have time to make elites playable to fight against there's a lot of con- continuity issues i see in halo but and that's one of them there really isn't a defining trait in this mission i want to say besides the fact that this is the first time you're playing as an odst broad daylight fighting through it's just like a rehash of the mamasa streets i just did five minutes before and this happens immediately after the drop so it's even a little weirder because you have prepared a drop then six hours pass and then you go back six hours (laughs) it would have been better if buck would have said squad work come in you know as he's talking rookie there bromie you're there mickey dutch anyone didn't really get to that he was talking to his his ex yeah he doesn't really talk about the squad does he he just runs for dare he was talking to his ex he was uh, thirsty for that. He wants the Oni Kuchi. Going on to Uplift Reserve. I really enjoyed this mission. This is one of the missions I thought was good for the game. Yeah, this mission reminds me a lot of Savo Highway. That's how it is. It reminds me a lot of Savo Highway, including visually. But what's funny is you can just blow through the entire thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which we did. But but like actually playing through it, it's kind of fun. There's a good variety of enemy vehicles. Good variety of enemy vehicles. And you can actually, if you actually play 
through it, there are random marine squads around that you can save. Which, which again, just feels like a Halo 3 level, which feels like Salvo Highway. Yes, I liked this mission, and I did like Salvo Highway. And I don't think it's, it, I don't think it's a bad mission. It's just not unique enough. And this is one of the only missions that there isn't anything like rehashed in. It's an actual built-in area. There's nothing redone like in the streets where it's just the same five buildings you see. Yeah, this that that's right, isn't it? Because you never walk in this area as rookie. And you see the space elevator, which is one of the things that I kind of wish you would have saw more in the game, except for this one time of the mission where you just see it explode. I kind of wish you would have saw like parts of it in the city. Yeah, because the space elevator is this cool defining feature of New Mombasa that kind of is in the background the whole time. Kings of Go Boulevard? I, I know I'm butchering the name, but the Boulevard mission. After you fly off at the end of the mission, Master Chief fashion, crash the uh, the vehicle that you're in. I love the, the ending of the cutscene, either Ghost or Warthog. And then you go right into getting into a tank, and then you're blowing through everything. It's another rehash of something that you know, Master Chief's done, but I also think it's pretty cool. And it was done pretty well but it's also same thing it's, it's redone it's very linear too like the the corridors you drive the tank through are really straight and they're not as open as the levels like the arc and the arc culminates into a fight with the scarab with it but this you shoot at some wraiths i guess there's nothing there's no climax to the tank fight and you just get out at the end there really isn't the, the city isn't really big enough unless they just blow away a big portion of the city which i'm sure they do and just throw a scarab down then you wouldn't really be able to do that i don't know i think maybe maybe they could have had something like the and this goes back into maybe they could have had kind of thing but they could have had like ground zero from where the, the slip space rupture blew up the city so you drive your tank into some big blown up area where the buildings and stuff are, are a lot sparser because they're just gone you could even throw in a reference into the uh, scarab that chief takes out into like you could have had that thing's corpse hanging around somewhere yeah this this takes place right after because yeah, canonically this is the only place on earth that the covenant landed because they were looking for key ship site which is why new Mombasa was important then going on to like oni alpha site though this mission i like the introduction of it i feel like the defense that they did kept and they kept being pushed back could have been done a little bit better but i did like it and then going into the oni headquarters and then you have extract from that building with those police officers Officers. I think the fallback stuff doesn't work as well because you can pretty much just sit outside and kill enemies as they come in. There's not a point where they really overwhelm you. And I guess we were playing on Heroic, so maybe it's differently if you're alone and differently if you're on a harder difficulty, but I felt like we could have sat out there a lot longer, but we just went inside because that was moving on the level. Blowing up the bridge is pretty cool in my book, even though it was kind of just, oh, press button, press button, press button, and press button make bridge go boom i would have to say my favorite mission ideal like idea wise is the police hq the new mabasa police hq really because that's my least favorite actually if it wasn't just the copy paste copy paste it would have been without a doubt my number one it, it's just kind of tied with uplift reserve because i do like the sniper missions and it's just fighting indoors even after romeo says what am i supposed to do with this inside of covenant carrier and then you're fighting indoors with a sniper rifle kind of that joke i i thought would be pretty cool with the end of oni alpha site and then the beginning of or like the middle of an mpd i guess when the police pelican shows up i know the reason they were using a pelican was because it was a leftover asset and they just retextured it for the game but it paints this picture that the police of new mombasa in 2552 are this basically a military unit and which i think is funny because we're having lots of issues with that in real life now with like police getting very militaristic and having like light armored vehicles and things like that yeah they've got a fucking military thing <laughs> that's flying around the city <laughs> it should have been done with the falcon because the falcon is a light transport vehicle while the pelican is a heavy transport vehicle yeah the falcon just didn't exist at that point because that wasn't until halo reach yeah which came out after this game but still like the idea of a pelican you know just taking out the guns of it and then like them saying we basically just threw the guns on real quick of a couple modifications would have been better still going into the idea of what could have been the only problem I have with that mission is the ending fight, which takes too long. 
long. I don't need, I don't know like the whole thing. Do you just got to survive? Do you have to kill a certain number of banshees? I don't know if there's some way to trigger it early or something, but yeah, you just kind of sit there and fire and just wait. Yeah, like I, I don't know if you have to just kill off a certain number of banshees before it comes in. Kikuwani Station, you know, the when you're underground and do the scarab fight. With the entire mission, besides the portion of it being on foot, the entire mission being in the air, I like it, but I don't. I feel like they could have done better with that. It's still pretty, you know, you just you just drop that into a little arena, you fight some stuff, then go through a hallway. Then you drop that into another arena, you fight some stuff, you go into a hallway, you drop that into a third arena, you fight some stuff. It's also very repetitive. Data Hive, I liked the, you know, descending down farther in like into the nest to get to Dare, get to the get to Virgil. But as, as of that point, it kind of just felt I just want to get this over with. This is taking too long. It's also very copy pasty. It is. This entire game is. Yeah, because every level feels exactly the same. Or, or, or every level of Data Hive, I mean. As you go deeper, feels the same. There's a couple of little visual differences, but it's mostly the same. And then you walk back out of it at the end. I kind of wish you could have just took the elevator all the way down because it was just like, oh, hey, you can take this elevator all the way up now. Thanks, Virgil. Well, I think the whole thing was he, he since he was controlling the electricity of the building or whatever, he had it locked down so he wouldn't have been able to use it. I don't know. Yeah, but remember, if you remember the police, that one police officer, the corrupt one, if you get the secret ending, which we didn't get because we didn't want to spend that time doing it, the, the police officer can't do it because Virgil says, no, screw you. Well, it could have used an elevator. We would have just went in, you know, had a camera looking at us click the button to go down to him and Virgil would have been like oh he's friendly or shoot us right towards him and then it would have been easy that entire mission could be bypassed in my eyes coastal highway coastal highway is pretty fun it's fun enough it is like a three mile stretch of highway that's almost identical every time but they sort of ramp up the stakes every time you're going through it's like a bunch of grunts then some more heavier enemies then some ghosts then some wraiths then then a scarab that they say they have the scarab pop in at the very end but it just kind of walks off and you can't aggro it at all which I thought was a little weird but I do like how you can make a mission easier at points when you shoot down the phantom you know that are holding the ghost those are the ghosts that you're fighting in the next area because they do that that's a callback to Halo 2 because you can do that in Halo 2 as well when you're in a tank driving across a bridge is you get to watch these phantoms come in and you can shoot the ghosts off the bottom you can't kill the phantoms but they, they don't end up dropping any ghosts because you kill them that's the first part of the mission pretty good I, I like that the defense of the end which is you know kind of overdone yeah that was just because because there was a firefight arena and that began where they started doing that with Halo Reach as well where you just kind of dumped out into these firefight arenas that they needed to use so you go through like three waves of firefight like look it's firefight in the campaign. It's and this is like the last bit of the campaign. We, we gotta throw some heavy stuff at them. The first wave they try to overwhelm you with a lot of like little enemies then they throw some heavier enemies and then in the last wave oh they're, they're Reef shooting at you. Those actually kind of got me when I didn't notice them. And you can't really use the tactic that I use. We just use like the turret at the top with infinite ammo and then just spray them all down. The last wave, there's the race, the hunters, the brute chieftains. They, they throw everything at you. Romeo, Mickey, and Dutch all here to sa save your asses and get out, get out of Dodge. And then you just uh, throw everybody on board and fly out. And then the epilogue is a whole bunch of messed up. The point at with the with which the epilogue happens is very weird because we we talk. So the game begins in the middle of Halo Two. If we go through the events of that, Master Chief is on in amber clad. They follow that ship through their slip space rupture and to halo we're assuming i don't know if slip space takes a while or not but i'm assuming let's say conservatively it takes a day to get to the halo ring because we never really get a timeline I, I i guess i could look it up but i don't know the timeline so it takes them a day to get to the halo ring they're on the halo ring for halo 2 we'll say three days pass so that's that's four days then chief gets on the key ship with truth at the end of those days and they fly back to earth that could have been another day or i think canonically it's like two weeks or something happens like truth makes a pit stop before earth for no reason um so that's like two weeks so even then you know you get maybe three weeks and, but this epilogue happens a month after the events of halo 2 and i don't know when the fuck this is because it's supposed to be before halo 3 but i don't think that makes sense a full month it's just it's weird i don't think like like what you're saying i don't think halo 3 happened in within a month like all of it like and getting everybody back because I think is Johnson died. And there's weird, there's weird fucky timeline stuff with Halo 
three anyways, which I go over in the completely accurate summary. I have like a rant section about it. <laughs> the epilogue taking place a month after doesn't make any sense because at this point, I think that Johnson would be on the arc or dead. I'm still a fan of it, even though you did point out a lot of things in it that I wouldn't have noticed. Right. And you definitely still can be like, I have a much more negative opinion of ODST. Same with Reach than a lot of people in the community. A lot of people like ODST a lot and they say it's their favorite, which I can I can understand liking Halo because it's still Halo. It's still fun. I don't like it because it's basically just Halo 3 to me and it's basically a repeat. But I think that's why a lot of people do like it because it is very Halo 3. Apparently back like when they were doing like they did polls of all the Halo games. Halo Reach was near the bottom of like the list of games people enjoyed. And I just don't understand. Like I can understand like you know people are just like the chief fanboys. I I, I can understand that. But I enjoy side stories. I I enjoy stuff that it explores all the characters. I don't like it when there's just one main group or one character. I like to see like this is the side character. He has this entire like backstory. Let's go let's go delve into that. There's I mean talking about Reach would be a whole other hour. Reach story is a bit inconsistent in its delivery and a couple of things in it and then noble six is literally just chief because there is no defining personality traits of noble six that would be it would differentiate for him from from chief so it oh yeah or for for reach and a lot of people also mechanically a lot of people didn't like spartan abilities and that that's you know that's a whole other conversation so we'll talk about that some other time <laughs> i didn't do a real thoughts for halo reach but it would be fun to go back and do that with some people 